Happy Friday, everyone. Today is May 18th, and this is episode 39 of Get Your Tech On, our show on all things Doxis. I'm Brady Volp, founder of Nimble This and the Volp Firm. Our Today, <laughs> with us is John Downey, the American Van Dam of Cable. John is also CMTS technical leader at Cisco Systems. Welcome, Jack John. <laughs> Jack John, Van Dam, twice the Van Damage. Yeah! <laughs> Thank God it's Friday. <laughs> also with us is Daniel Atman, owner and innovator of NRES in Belgium. And he would be wearing orange if his Dutch team had made it to the World Cup, but they didn't. Uh, Dan, don't feel bad. Neither yeah, did I had to bring that up to you. <laughs> so, welcome, Dan. Glad to have you, you with us. Hey, g glad to be here. Uh, thanks for, for inviting me. Awesome. So, Dan, um, I mean, everyone knows where John and I are from, but uh, tell us uh, where, where, are you, uh, where are you broadcasting from? So I'm, I'm uh, uh, a Dutch guy living in Belgium, uh, actually north of uh, Antwerp. Um, so, so my kids are, uh, you know, I've been living here for 20 years. My kids are actually, you know, they're, they're, they're Belgium. So I'm constantly reminded of the fact that the Dutch are not participating in, in the soccer tournament, the World Cup. So thanks for that, uh, Brady. No, no, I didn't uh, want to leave that fact out. I <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yeah, I started out in Misery Love Company. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> started out at Cisco in '96, um, and been involved at the early days of Doxis. I think it was '98 when the the, the 7200 was introduced. Um, so so I, I I may look old. I actually am old. Um, and um, left Cisco, you know, long, long history in the cable BU at Cisco, left it in 2013, I think, to spend a year at uh, Casa, um, Casa Systems. People always say I pronounce that incorrectly, but anyways. Um, then I was asked to come back again at Cisco and, um, you know, did, did my tour of uh, cable again and, and some, some routing service provider stuff, um, you know, the, the thing with all the IP packets and, and stuff like that. Uh, interesting, um, and um, left Cisco at uh, the end of last year, and right now I'm doing my own thing. So I've got my own gig, doing a lot of work with uh, with a lot of startups. That's actually really cool. So it's it's uh, you know new technology, it's uh, small companies, and help them out to uh, to to grow their business and be successful, right? And uh, and also working with uh, cable operators in Europe. Uh, you know, help them validate the, the, the strategies that they put in place for, for next-gen access um, and uh, stuff like that. It's really interesting, actually. Yep. Cool. Yep. So today's topic um, is, I think, going to focus on some of the background your work, work that you've done is on 10 gigabit uh, over coax cable. So right. I, I think we'll, we'll lead into some of that. But first... What has been sweeping the social media news is a, a really important topic right now is, is it Yanny or is it Laurel? And uh, with without further ado, I'm going to let you guys decide on what that is. So please <laughs> listen closely. Not working. I didn't hear it. <laughs> Oh, you didn't hear it? John, did you hear it? No, 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 it ah, didn't come through. It's not coming through. Okay. So I'm not sure why I can hear that, it. That answers the question. <laughs> <laughs> that answers the question. Who the freak cares? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> ah, too bad. So, well, uh, I'm not sure why. So I can hear it, but unfortunately, you guys cannot. But uh, so, yeah. So, so have you heard the, the Laurel and Yanny? Um, uh, uh, I read about it, but no, I haven't heard it. Yeah. God, uh, it's too bad. I don't know why you guys can't hear it, and I can. <laughs> but I'm playing it right now, so. I, well, I still think that I still think the dress is black, or whatever, black and gold, or blue and gold, or whatever that dress was. Uh, okay, <laughs> so well, I'm not going to worry about it. But uh, if if you haven't heard it, it's it's a the, the the latest meme going around on social media. You should check it out. Uh, I'll put it in the notes below. Uh, in the in the video here, but uh, I hear Laurel. That's all I hear. But um, my wife hears Yanny, and <laughs> I just can't understand the difference. So it's it's a it's a cool clip. Uh, wish you guys could hear it, but uh, too bad for you. You know you missed out on that. <laughs> 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 I don't know, I sleep on that one. <laughs> so, 
All right. Well, let's move on to uh, 10 gig Ethernet and uh, or over a co coax. And Daniel, this is uh, sort of the area that, that you've uh, mm. you've been ex exploring. We actually right. covered last year, uh, John and I, right after the Angacom show. And, and I will say the Angacom show is coming up. We'll probably cover that a little bit towards the end. Um, but a company that I saw when I was over in Germany last year, uh, Gaiax, I think I'm pronouncing it right, has a has a cool solution sure. to do 10 gigabit over coax. And I think you've had some uh, experience with them, Daniel. So yep. I would like to understand this concept, this technology a little better, and maybe you can give us an intro on it and, and a little overview of the technology. Yeah, absolutely. So um, it's actually really cool. Um, you know, when I was at Cisco, I was uh, kind of skeptical about it, but um, now that 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 you learn more about it is is really really cool i mean to, to start from the top and to go down right start at the, the high level from a strategy perspective um if, if you look at the networks that are that you know jerk the the owner of uh, of dx he uh, he kicked this off right and uh, he was looking for a solution for the problem that german operators have they've got big huge nodes um, segment sizes are huge, long cascades, um, and that, that's all coming out of the, the BK technology that they're using, which is a specific HFC technology. Um, and you know, as, as, as your nodes are, are huge, obviously you get into problems as you start um, bumping up your capacity in, in the service group from a, from a DOCSIS perspective. You have to resegment, right? You, get, you have to reduce the node sizes. And the, the the cost of doing that in the German operators was was just so high that um, it it you know the business case just was not there for these guys to uh, uh, to do the node splits required. Um, and here was Jörg thinking about how to resolve the problem, and and he actually found a way to get it with a university in uh, in Germany to solve it by using some of the wireless technology and put that on coax. So what he's done is actually taking um, Ethernet technology uh, over wireless, put that on coax, and utilizing the coax cable to transport 10 gig Ethernet over it. So you can actually um, push the RPD way deep into the, uh, the network, solving the need to, uh, to start digging fiber. Um, and, and I hope you guys are sitting down, but, but the cost savings over four years for all of the German operators is above the 2 billion euros. So 2 billion euros, that's what, $10 billion or something like that these days? <laughs> or something like that, but... <laughs> I, I don't know that it's, it's two to one. But, <laughs> it's, it's <laughs> but, but, I mean, cost savings, cost savings. So, but, I mean, how, are oh, yeah. they, how are they realizing this cost savings? It's, 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 it's huge. I mean, think I, I was shocked. 2 billion euros, that's two and a, two and a half billion dollars. It's, it's just shocking, uh, the, the cost saving. And, and that's, only, that's only for remote five, right? Um, because if you think about it, the technology is, is enabling 10 gig ethernet to start with, right? 10 gig, it's enabling 10 gig over coax. That means that, that you can use it for anything, right? Remote Fi, remote Mac Fi, any DA technology will work. Um, think about mobile backhaul, right? The, the, the latency is, is extremely low uh, on this technology. And um, it, it just happens to be that you know, the, the soon to be biggest operator in Germany, Vodafone, who's buying up the LGI affiliates, is also a major mobile operator. Um, so utilizing your own plan to, to backhaul mobile is, is again a cost save. Um, you can use it for fiber to the business, you can use it for distributed palm. Um, it's, uh, it's a great versatile tool that, that you're giving these, these operators. Um, it, and it's an overlay network. Right, so you're keeping your existing services in place. Um, they operate above the 1.2 gig, so anything that's below um, just stays there. There's um, there's really not uh, not an impact on the existing network. So it's extremely cool technology. Yeah. So so I, I mean, it's, it it sounds really so, great, but how? What is the you know how do we go from from something like this to a remote Fi device, or and what is the the underlying technology? It almost sounds too good to be true. Yeah, so this is using um, uh, you know basic modulation uh, technique on uh, coax above the 1.2, right? And they, they split up the the uh, downstream uh, spectrum and the upstream spectrum. So first you start with the uh, downstream spectrum, um, and uh, and above that you put the the upstream spectrum. That's a single carrier, um, and I think they can go up to 1k qualm 
uh, from a, a modulation perspective. So they go, they start at 1.2 um, and they go up to 3.5 gigahertz or something like that. Um, so, so yeah, there, there is an implication on a network, right? Because existing, you cannot use existing amplifiers for that. So what they do is they bypass existing uh, amplifiers, actives or passives, right? Uh, the passive, that's all other story that we should talk about, but the actives are bypassed. Um, and, uh, and that way they, uh, they're actually taking out the signal off the network, off the coaxial cable. They have a, a relay um, component and they put it back on uh, the coaxial cable after the amplifier. Um, and then they, again, go, go forward to the next active. Um, so it's, um, you know, that, that's really the, the, the way it's done. Um, two big carriers um, of, um, um, what is it, 3.5, 1, 1, 1 point, uh, 1 point X gigahertz. John can do the math. He's a lot better than, than I am at that. <laughs> <laughs> but um, so, 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 so I see it more like this is great for a brownfield solution oh, yeah. where you don't you're not doing a new de, 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 new development because oh, yeah. um, yeah. if you're doing new development you just run fiber oh, yeah. but if you're this, trying to utilize existing coax uh, it's an easy way to get digital signal yep. uh, much higher speed Look, i mean um, you, and i gotta so, wonder would you worry about bypassing amplifiers or just get it to the rpd or a remote fi device and then just kind of send it from there i guess there's different architectures you could draw out yeah, so let me start with the first one, right? I mean, this this is a, an architecture that is indeed brownfield. If you're if you're you're uh, and I, I could argue also only if it's underground, uh, but it's kind of depending on the cost. Um, but if it's a new network, you're gonna start with fiber, right? Um, because you have to dig anyways. Um, this only makes sense if you have to start digging into the ground because that's the most important uh, thing from a costing perspective, right? Um, if it's on a strand mounted on uh, on poles, it is it is going to be depending on on the cost of replacing the coax with uh, with fiber uh, on pole. But it's got that that cost is going to be substantially lower than uh, than digging, right? Um, and in Europe, it's everything everything is underground. Um, even in the US, I mean, look at uh, some of the charter footprint; it's underground. Um, you know, the big metropolitan areas, it's all underground, right? Uh, most of it, anyways. Um, so first, you, you save cost uh, with this technology because you don't have to dig fiber. Second of all, um, I don't know how it is in the US, but in, in Europe, if you want to start digging, you have to get permits. It will take you six months before you have the permits to, to actually start digging. Um, and then you have to schedule the crews. You don't have a lot of crews to start digging and pulling fiber. Um, so it will take you six to, to eight months before uh, you can actually um, get to a point where the fiber is into the ground. Um, you know, these, these guys turned on a, a trial network um, in Germany. They did it in three days. So compare that with, uh, with the eight months of, uh, six to eight months of, of getting to a stage where you finally have to fiber into the ground. Um, so it, it's, a, it's a huge cost saving and, and the time to market is a lot lower. You can really uh, quite quickly adapt to market conditions. Um, as well, think about, yeah, let's take a step away from, from DOCSIS here. Think about um, new fiber to the business opportunities. Think about new pawn opportunities, right? If you want to respond very quickly as an operator to new opportunities, but you don't have the time or the cost uh, payback, the return on investment to start digging fiber, you can use this technology of a coax, build up your customer base, quickly respond to customer needs, um, and then um, dig fiber once the take up is, is uh, strong enough. Um, and you, your, your second question, John, I'm sorry, I'm getting old. I forgot. What was that? <laughs> no, John I, can't remember either. Other he, I not, what are I we going to do? I, I don't. I think, you, I think you tiptoed around my subject in my comments anyway. So. I never tiptoed around. <laughs> um, so the, the other solution I saw about a year or two ago I thought was interesting, and I'm sure you saw it too, Daniel, was I think they're a company out of Georgia that um, – if they had the trench, it would be too expensive. There was existing coax under the ground. They would blow out the center right. conductor and dielectric with yep. some type of chemical mm -hmm. uh, and then use the existing outer sheath of the coax as a conduit and then blow yep. the fiber through that. So that was kind of an interesting idea as well, how to get fiber through an existing right. underground cable 
without removing the cable or digging. Yep. So I, I think what you're looking at then, uh, John, is is again the cost, right? Cost comparison between the two and and timing, right? Um, and uh, in the end, it's going to be a cost exercise. If blowing fiber into a coaxial cable is doable and it's cheaper, you know, the, uh, operators probably will go for that. Uh, but but nevertheless, there is even in the US an interest uh, by customers uh, in this technology. So I'm not sure what what the deal is there with the blowing of uh, the fiber, but it might not apply to everything, um, and it might not be a solution for everything. Um, but yeah, um, you know, if if you're able to to pull fiber, go for it. Um, and this this would not be the solution. But if you have coax in place and, um, and you need to respond fast to to customer uh, requirements, yeah. um, you know, this this is a solution. And you know, it doesn't stop at 10 gig, right? Um, the technology will go far beyond that, um, significantly beyond that, actually. Um, that, that, that also, John, leads me to, um, to think about FDX, right? Um, FDX, so far, it's, it, you have to have M plus zero. Um, I, I think you can, you can count the number of operators that have uh, deployed M plus zero large scale on a single hand. Um, deploying M plus zero is expensive, right? Um, so if this kind of technology could allow FDX to be deployed in a non -F M plus zero environment, uh, that's, a, that's a very positive thing, right? Yeah, so I have, I have a couple of points to make if I can remember them all while I'm doing them. But uh, to, your, to your item, John, on uh, blowing fiber, uh, I thought that was just the coolest technology that they could core out coax and blow fiber through it. I've seen them do it a couple of times. And then recently, I've heard, I'm, I'm not sure if this is correct, but I believe the company that was doing that is, is no longer in business that was doing that. If, if, uh, if someone is hearing me and, and knows that that's incorrect, please let me know. I think some of the challenges were um, when you're trying to do that type of thing and, and blowing out the coax, you have to take the system out of service. So that that was one of the big challenges oh. with doing that. Uh, you know, in in concept, it's really a good idea, but you're going to be taking all those subs offline whenever you're you're actually trying to do that. That was kind of one of the issues with blowing fiber through coax. So great concept, just in th in practice, it wasn't so great. The other uh, point back to you, Dan. Mm -hmm. um, and do you go by Dan or Daniel? I, I got to clarify Whatever. that. Uh, okay, cool. Because I I will always shorten people to names. Um, with Doxus 3.1, uh, one of the things that we've talked about and had challenges with is that we can go all the way up to 1.8 gigahertz in mm -hmm. the Doxus 3.1 specification. Yep. But one of the challenges is having being able to transmit signals at 1.8 gigahertz and actually have them reach the modems. In the technology that you're talking about, you're getting up into, what did you say, three gigs or past yep, three above, gigs? Above, yeah. above three gigs. Yep. How does that work? How do you, how do, I mean, do you right. just have really high transmitter? Good point. So a very good point. Thank you. Um, so so the, the, the main difference here, um, Brady, is that, that this is a transport solution, right? This is not meant to go to people's, uh, to, to the residential area. This is purely a means to transport um, over, uh, your your trunk cable. Um, that's what this is. So you're not dealing with um, taps. You're you're basically dealing with actives most of the, most of the time. Um, but, so, but you said you're bypassing the active, so you don't have the yes. benefit of amplifying that signal again, right? Well, I do because so so here is the um, let, let me talk a bit about the uh, the architecture itself, right? Um, and this applies to all of these uh, these architectures that are out there. So um, you start at the node. And in, an, in a remote PHY, remote MacFi environment, you would have a remote PHY device or remote MacFi device in that node, right? So what happens is, um, as this technology uh, gets deployed, we don't put that RPD in that node, but we put a, a gateway in that node. And that gateway has a um, you know, 10 gig Ethernet interface um, and um, has a coaxial output. So with the special uh, diplex filter, we put that signal or uh, within the node or outside of the node um, probably if it's at the node, it's internal into the node, we put that signal onto the coaxial cable. Um, from there on, um, as soon as you hit the first amplifier, you take it off the coaxial cable again, and within the, uh, the amp, 
um, sidecar or within a new housing, you would have either a relay device um, or a switch node or the gateway. And I'll get to the, to the difference between the three. So you would put in a gateway if you uh, terminate at that amp and put an RPD next to it, right? And then that RPD would basically put um, uh, the signal or the, the, all the palm carriers back on, on the coaxial uh, cable. Um, if you want to bypass that amp, you only put the relay in it. And the relay will basically take the signal off the coaxial cable um, and put it right back on it. Look at it as a kind of an amplifier uh, device. It's a relay, right? Um, so you, that, that also allows you to span larger uh, distances uh, with this technology because at each active device, you take the signal, you take the signal off the cable and, and you, um, you kind of amplify it again and put it back on the cable, right? Now, um, now, now, now in, in my mind, an amplifier is amplifying an RF signal. I just want to clarify, are you just re-amplifying this no. really high frequency signal or are you no. demodulating? Because yes. it must be an RF signal. You're yeah, demodulating yeah, yeah. it, yes. cleaning it up and yes. then retransmitting a new RF signal, which would yes. mean that you're, this is, this is much more intelligent than an amplifier. Yes. 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 Oh, yeah. Yeah. You know what? You probably should hire you because you're doing this a lot better than I am. Um, so <laughs> well, I don't know anything about it, man. I'm just trying to understand what you're doing. <laughs> so, but, so and, that, but I think the difference is an amplifier. Every time you amplify an RF signal, it gets degraded because you exactly. have, you're introducing noise signal and, and stuff like that. But if you're actually demodulating this signal, yeah. uh, cleaning it up, well, it, well, when you're demodulating, it, you're getting a nice clean signal again. And yeah, then transmitting that RF signal. You're, yeah. you're doing a lot better of a job than what an amplifier would do. Exactly. Yeah. So, uh, so that that's the relay, and and um, you know, often these uh, these amps have uh, multiple outputs as well, right? So we can actually put a switch node in there um, that that takes that initial signal and and kind of splits that amongst the different RPDs that that you could put uh, right next to it. So that that gets you to uh, sharing that initial ten gig over uh, multiple um, uh, branches if, if you would want to do that. Um, so there, there are multiple so any, options any there. Place you demod the signal, so any place you demod the signal, you could put an, an RPD, an interoperable RPD with a CMTS core or cloud or X2. Or, or, yeah. or, or remote Mac Fi RPD, yeah. OK. Yep. Um, you know, th well, th this is just a, a well, not just. It's it's actually pretty cool, but it, it's 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 a ten gig Ethernet over coax, right? Um, so whatever runs on it, we don't care. It's very low latency. Um, and it's like uh, twelve microseconds or something like that. Um, so it's it's um, it, it can carry time sensitive uh, uh, data, which is why people are looking at it for mobile backhaul as well. Um, and um, you can put as many RPDs on there. As you want, uh, but remember that um, this is a point-to-point -point technology, right? Um, so you start off with a 10 gig. Um, if you put multiple RPDs behind it with a switch node, you're sharing that 10 gig. Not that that is a bad thing because 10 gig is a is a whole lot of data, um, but uh, th that's the way it works, right? It's it's a point-to-point, -point and a switch node really makes it a point to. I shouldn't say it is not point to multi point because you're you're actually taking a signal and basically put that in put that in, into a switch, right? And after the switch, you put multiple RPDs um, or uh, multiple gateways to put the signal back onto uh, the coax cable again. Um, but um, yeah, that, that's that's the way it works. And you know, we're starting off with 10 gig. Nothing stops this technology to go significantly beyond that. You know, all, all technology evolves; uh, it, it will it will grow. Yeah. So, I mean, this looks like a complementary um, technology for Doxis. That yep. say I'm an operator, I have Doxis 3.0. Um, I would, and I'm starting to say, well, I need to go to Doxis 3.1 some someday in the future. Oh. Maybe FDX Doxis. Um, Who knows? Yep. We we could look at this as a technology that we would say, well, we can also throw this in the pie. At what point do these start to cross over and we say, well, you know, maybe instead of going FDX, we start to just say, well, we could add this into the mix with RPDs. Uh, what kind of what kind of guidance would you give a cable operator or an MSO and say, hey, 
let's start putting these technologies together and and you know one plus one equals five with these different technologies so so i think that uh, you know if you look at the the technology that they're developing keep in mind that so what, what we're doing is um um one band of downstream and right next to it is another band of upstream data that's how you get to 10 gig symmetrical we're not even doing full duplex right um the technology we know exists look at full duplex access right um the technology exists to to overlay these uh, these frequencies on top of each other um so it is um i, I think this technology could uh, shows serious potential to grow far beyond the 10 gig um and um you know brady it's it's a, it's a cost uh, analysis for these operators right um if they if they have the coax network in place um and this technology makes sense for them from a costing perspective they can put it in place it's it's all about the cost to dig and deploy fiber um that is what uh what what this makes uh you know makes the, the pivot go go the right way or the wrong way um that that's all discussion the cost of deploying fiber um and um, if you start looking at fdx then the whole dynamics change because then it's not only fiber anymore you're looking at an m plus zero environment that right now you need i know you know kill labs probably working to resolve that it will never be doable in an m plus four m plus three environment fdx right um if they're going to be able to extend it it's going to be m plus one m plus two uh, perhaps, but not more beyond that. This technology will allow them to deploy FDX in M plus four uh, environments um, without any problem, um, because you're pushing the RPD out into the field, right? And that means that you can actually have a virtual M plus zero environment, even with retaining the coax in place and all the the amps in place. So that that's that that's a big benefit in my belief. Yeah. So that that'd be the guidance that that I would give. First, let's look at the cost exercise. Does it make sense for you? Look at the future as well. Where are you going to go with FDX? Is it something that you're looking at? Uh, what, what, how does your network look like? What amount of cascades do you have? Um, all that comes into play. <clears throat> it, this, is, this is not rocket science, this technology. Um, this is not uh, resolving all the problems. It's, it's a, another toolkit that we're giving operators, right? Um, and if it makes sense for, for operators, Go for it, deploy it. This is why one of the largest. So, so I have a question. Good. Well, if, if it's 10 gig over coax, uh, and then you're going to an RPD, at what point would you say, why even go to an RPD? If it's 10 gig over coax, coax, coax right to the home. Why couldn't it be like uh, G pon, E pon? Yeah. Um, you're right. So first of all, this, this is not a residential technology uh, yet because the cost is uh, too high to be residential, but okay. uh, it, it may evolve into that, right? Um, I, I personally don't think it's a doxus killer, if, if you put it like that. Um, I think it's just another tool in the toolbox uh, for operators uh, to make sure that doxus okay. is successful, yeah. right? Uh, but nothing stops operators from from, you know, not only putting an RPD on that uh, that link, but also putting an SFP with POM capabilities, OLT capabilities in it, um, and serves a small uh, POM uh, network. That's double, anyways. Um, and and in addition to that, you know, uh, fire up uh, uh, a link to to uh, to a new industry park that's out there where you don't have fiber yet, uh, but you happen to have a coaxial uh, yeah, like Wi-Fi Wi-Fi hotspot. Wi-Fi hotspots. Wi-Fi right? hotspots. Yep. So, um, you know, it's, I, I, we're getting closer and closer to, to an actual node as a platform, right? Because what, what this technology is doing, this technology is putting 10 gig um, Ethernet into the node, um, into any, into the AMP, actually. Um, so it's, it's really um, opening up the network for, for a multi-service environment, not only in RPD, uh, but, but anything you have that, that might be applicable. And if there is another access technology that uh, that gets the job done cheaper, better than Doxis, I, I think everybody is agnostic here, right? We're just looking at getting getting out there the best uh, technology for for our customers, the service providers that are out there. Uh, Doxis is a cool technology; I love it. But um, you know, as as FDX uh, gets out there, we're going to have those same discussions with uh, with operators that we had when Doxis one 
dot well not one one dot studio dog got there when three dog got there when three point one got there um you know th th that will constantly happen um what we're doing with this is we're again just opening up the toolbox right 10 gig bam there you go deployed in three days you're done okay so it sounds like a cool technology and we've kind of focused on the exciting parts of it let's talk about yep. some of the real world impairments now that we're going to run into like when my 2.5 gigahertz or 2.5 gigahertz wi-fi gets coupled onto the coax line and yep. So, I mean, we're going to have impairments that are getting out there. We have to, how do technicians troubleshoot this technology? Like figuring out when that RF, when my Wi-Fi signal is now coupled on there and impairing your your channel that is carrying that. How, what are you What are you right. seeing? How do you do error correction for that type of stuff? So, so we're using LDPC, right? Um, error correction. Um, so, actually, so it's it's an interesting topic. So, um, so the cables in Germany are. Uh, bamboo cables. I don't know if, if that means anything to you guys. Bamboo? Bamboo, yeah. So they have these these notches. It's not a solid core. They have these notches um, every, you know, on, on a certain distance. Like a radial disc every di every so often? Yeah. And depending on, on the, the length that they have, the spacing, you get impairments, right, um, in the network. And those those frequencies, you, you need to stay well away from. Um, so what these guys can do, they can actually, it's a very flexible architecture. They can move around these nudges. Uh, so if there is a carrier out there that um, error correction cannot deal with, just move around it. Um, so it's a very flexible uh, flexible way of, uh, of dealing with impairments on the network. But, uh, but yeah, if you have a, a, a full-fledged spectrum that's being used by multiple technologies, um, it's, it doesn't have uh, OFDM yet, um, and uh, that, that's so more of it. It's SC QAM, is yeah, that yeah. It? okay? Yep. Single so, uh, QAM. Yeah, and that's that's not because of the, the technology cannot do it, it's just that this specific chipset did not have the capability. So it's not being ruled out for future use, but um, just for this specific chipset, it wasn't there. But I think that um, the flexibility that they had to go through for the German coaxial plant shows that they can move around impairments on the network right so uh, so we're talking i think i think uh, john do you remember the i think we have a we've re, we've run into this you're calling it bamboo cable but we've we have had i don't think it's used often but there is some older cable mc squared yeah uh, tri trilogy's mc squared cable yeah yeah, yeah so i mean it was basically when you looked at impedance mismatches every perfectly uh separated uh it just builds up reflection reflection causes uh, Oscillation. Yep. And usually it used to be discs, it would cause a suck out at say 570 megahertz. Then they changed the way they extruded the cable or how they put the disc or how where these impedance dispatches showed up, and the suck out occurred close to 1.2 gigahertz. And at the time, no one cared because we stopped at one gig. Who would ever use it? Now that we're gig. going to 1.2 <laughs> gig. Yeah. And, and I think a lot of people have replaced a lot of that coax over the years, but there might be left. You know, and you're right. I mean, I used to say, you know, the higher we go in frequency, the more temperamental the cable is. One little dent in the cable, a little impedance mismatch, higher frequencies show high in roll off when there's moisture. Um, so, yeah, we definitely, it's still an RF realm, right, Daniel? You're still talking about RF, yep. uh, really high frequency. Um, yep. Up to so, 40. I mean, that can, yeah. So we need test equipment to be able to see that, you know, spectrum analyze it can, can monitor that. And maybe the, uh, the devices you're going to install in the field that demod the signal have built in spectrum analysis, like the cable motors have full bandwidth capture. Maybe they have that functionality. I don't know. Um, yeah, there is, there is a that, something that might. Yeah, they, they do have management capabilities. I'm not sure if it's spectrum uh, management capabilities that they have, John, uh, you know, that's something I can check, but, um, um, you know, keep in mind, right, from an interference perspective, the um, the the network that that you would be targeting with this kind of technology is not the network above ground. It's the network below ground. It's is not the network that goes into houses, right? Um, that that actually also decreases the risk of impairment, I think. Um, but um, typically, you'd find that. Um, uh, they're able to work around impairments quite nicely. 
um, you know, the German plans were were quite old, um, and um, uh, they've been around there for for a while. And with the bamboo cables, all the impairments that were out there, they've been able to work around those. Yeah. How about the passives that are underground? So I know you have to you have to bypass amplifiers. Um, some of the passives, uh, you know, yeah, that's as probably. we know, all, uh, support only a limited frequency because yep. of the devices that, or the, yep. the passive devices in them. Yeah, if there's passives, um, obviously you need to uh, uh, to replace those by uh, by passives that can deal with the higher frequencies, right? Otherwise, it wouldn't work. Um, so that's something that uh, they have they have a solution for. They've they've got those passives, but then you need to look at um, you know what. I guess for every customer, you need to identify the passive um, passives that they have in place. Although I think that uh, if you look at uh, the, the vendor landscape of passives, you'll find that the vendor landscape is actually quite limited. Um, I believe there's all the vendors get their, their gear from, from, from one vendor, I believe. Uh, what was the name again? Uh, uh, I forgot it. Anyways, so the, you're going to have to replace the, uh, the passives, right? Um, in order to do with the higher frequencies. Yep, absolutely. Have there been like some sort of good lessons learned from your initial experience with it where operators have figured out ways of saying, okay, we can either sweep the cable or we, you know, how do they figure out where maybe the passives <coughs> are or where the big suck outs are due to the bamboo cable? And like, I mean, this could be helpful for a lot, not just this technology, but when they want to run DOCSIS 3.1 at higher frequencies. Have they come up with a ni really nice solution for looking? I, I think no. I think they use the the standard tools available to them to have to look at the uh, the network, right? Because obviously they had to do that. Uh, look at the network that is in play and uh, and see where the problem areas were. Um, so I think uh, from from a lessons learned perspective, uh, that there is not a whole lot that uh, that we can add to that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I like what John said. Um, if there was a way that the technology you guys are using could mm -hmm. have some sort of uh, spectrum, you know, full band capture equivalent integrated into it, where when you start deploying it, you could somehow uh, view the whole spectrum of the system, especially at much higher yeah. frequencies. That could be a really nice built-in test, you know, sort of like a proactive yeah. network maintenance test that we do. Um, very helpful for operators, very helpful for your technology, but also helpful in, in other ways to see <laughs> well, how high of RF spectrum can we use, especially as we we're trying to use these higher RF spectrums. John, you, I mean, what are you thinking uh, as using these high spectrum areas? Well, so, 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 I mean, uh, obviously the more, the more, the more visibility we have, the better we are obviously. But uh, I got to wonder when you look at, you know, um, the sampling that's needed at higher frequencies, uh, the cost that could, I, I don't know the feasibility. I mean, obviously we can do a uh, spectrum analysis on full bandwidth capture via the cable modem at really, really cheap and small uh, you know, uh, devices. Uh, but I don't know all the way up to those frequencies if it's possible at the price points we need. Yeah, so I, I didn't want to mislead you, uh, uh, Brady. Um, that's probably, you know, my, my marketing years doing that. Um, but there, there is no uh, spectrum <laughs> management uh, capability as such, but they do have uh, measurement capabilities. It's just not being uh, put into these really nice graphics that uh, that you're used to, right? Uh, but the data is there and can be pulled. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. So I mean, those graphics. That's that's always up for the software engineers to do. That's <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and make it nice. <laughs> <laughs> so. What? Um. So I, I guess uh, you know we have the Anga show coming up, and mm. we're going to see technologies there, but. What what other technology trends are are you seeing? So in in the particularly in the European market, since you're so embedded there. Yeah, so I think that what's happening right now is uh, you know from a cable access perspective, right? Um, you know, I think if you talk to to people about remote fi uh, DAA, um, everybody thought that we would already have deployments out there. Well, they're not, right? You've got some that were announced. I think Eris announced. A remote fi deployment uh but that's just kicking off right um and that's with the uh, nodes uh, i believe um i think harmonic did a deployment with uh, shelves in uh sweden um and and obviously what uh, i think is happening as well as the whole uh, remote uh fi remote mac fi 
you know, flex flexible Mac architecture discussion that's happening. Um, people tend to get a bit confused and looking at vendors right now. And as in, you know, okay, what, what's, what's happening? What, what should I do now? Um, so I think that that plays, um, so that, that, that's one, and we can dive into that a bit more favorite topic of mine. Um, and, and then you have your virtualization, right? And that's all over the place as well. Um, I think there's a lot of hype around, uh, the, the cloud native, sorry to do that, but, um, I have to do it when I talk about cloud native, um, you know, architectures, what, what, what is the benefit? Um, I, I'm convinced that a lot of people um don't understand why using uh, a docker architecture or a cloud native architecture as they call it is is important what benefit does it give them um and uh, could you do could you achieve the same thing with a virtual machine based approach um i think it's it's a very polarized discussion right now uh between the two architectures because um vm based is not all bad um and and cloud native is not the valhalla um and um i think they're, they're even within cloud native there are different uh, approaches right um are, do you have how many microservices do you have what do you use for your microservices uh, right is it is it an architecture that has two microservices and you call it cloud native or, or do you actually have divided up all the the different components within your your CMTS into uh, appropriate microservices so that you grow, can grow elastically the services that you want to offer. Um, uh, you know, I, I think as well that um, the flexible Mac architecture, like, right, with the controller, um, is going to seriously disrupt the vendor landscape because all of a sudden, um, you know, the, the big the big C caps um, will be changing, right? Um, the vendors that are working uh, virtual systems are going to have to adapt as well, because all of all of a sudden, all of a lot of that software is going to be pushed out into the field. Um, but but the whole industry as such is also quite fragmented. You've got Comcast, you've got uh, you know uh, the Charter, Cox, the LGI, Vodafone, NBN. They all have their own view on things uh, that that could be challenging, but as well as an opportunity. Um, so that is really on the minds of, uh, from a cable access perspective, on the minds of the European operators. And then, um, you know, if, if you look at Europe, you've got LGI. Well, I should I should state them in, in level of um, importance from a sizing perspective. You've got Vodafone, you've got LGI, and you've got Altice, right? Altice, um, I think, is heading down the, uh, right now, heading down the PON um, direction. They have their own PON vendor, right? Uh, PTI or Altis Labs, as they call it. Um, LGI, um, depending on the affiliate, will will pursue remote FI, but you know uh, they're also looking at the the flexible Mac architecture. Um, Vodafone um, is deploying the, the the China Doxa solution uh, from Huawei in Spain, um, and has uh, um, uh, ICMTS ICCAP uh, in in Germany. And undoubtedly is looking at uh, at remote fi as well, perhaps even remote map fi. I don't know. Um, so it's it's uh, I think very interesting industry right now with a lot of uncertainties for vendors. Um, it could go left, right, uh, straight ahead, backwards. Well, let's take for... a step back and and really see yeah, how was that for a tiptoe and tap dance. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let's take a step backwards and just say. What is driving it? What what does the European market look like as far as speeds, required speeds, uh, demanded speeds, competition? Is there any competition really pushing one gig services? So 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 people talk about Europe as if everybody in Europe does the same thing, right? It's a very fragmented. <laughs> Wait, 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 wait. They don't do the same thing? <laughs> no, no, they don't. We just make it look like we all do the same thing. <laughs> And when nobody's <laughs> looking, we kick ourselves in the back. So, <laughs> um, so, so there is a lot of competition. Um, I, I think you know speeds of one gig are, are being talked about and even uh, offered already. Um, some countries have uh, a lot of fiber uh, competition, and there is more and more talk about governments um, uh, supporting fiber. Because fiber has the perception to be, uh, you know, the best uh, next thing on earth, uh, and you really need fiber in order to to offer one gig services. Don't know where they got that, but 
Um, so there is is highly political where you'll find that uh, the the telcos that are um, from a historical perspective were owned by the governments. The telcos still have a huge lobby machine into the governments and are able to push the fiber agenda. Um, but having said that, with um, uh, you know developments on on DSL and GDA fast and, and so forth, um, you know I think that the uh, the fiber deployments that are out there uh, were effectively slowed down a bit, as happened with uh, 3.0, that that kind of slowed down some of the fiber deployments because all of a sudden these speeds were possible on on cable networks as well, um, and cable operators out there are very eager right now to show that they can do one gig services um, and are very eager to show high upstream bandwidth services with 3.1 uh, because that's what they need to, to change the perception. And I, again, I say the perception of the people out there that believe that you really need fiber in order to, to be serious from a service provider perspective, uh, which is obviously incorrect. Um, but um, I think there's a whole lot of marketing in play right now. So. You know, if you look at the service levels in Europe, uh, anywhere from from 200 to 500 megabits. You know, uh, most countries have those, um, and a lot of countries already uh, are at the one gig from a top tier perspective um, from a service offering. Um, I think right now, uh, you know, um, Quadplay is is quite hot, right? Offering your own mobile services. Uh, more and more operators have that. Actually, I think uh, you're getting quite close to the majority of the operators um, offering a mobile service as well in order to play in the, in the bundle game, right? Uh, data, voice, mobile, uh, and video. Um, and, and more and more operators are actually tying into uh, to Netflix as well um, to offer that service as well as an embedded service within their, their, their service offering. Um, so that, that, that is what, what is happening right now. It's, it's not only technology, but it's also the whole uh, OTT and, and uh, quad play thing that that's happening. So uh, tying into like what John said, one of the drivers. So mm -hmm. speed is obviously going up. You're talking about one gigabit. Speed. Uh, absolutely. Yep. Um, but a common, I would say, a common denominator, as I understand, in the European market is most most everything is underground. Yeah. So pulling fiber, pulling new fiber anywhere is then cost prohibitive. So. One yes. of the driving technologies is how can we get more out of the existing coax that's buried, right. which is also, I mean, not 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 an uncommon thing. I think a lot of folks look at the U.S. market and say, well, there's so much aerial plant. We also do have a lot of buried plant, but we, you know, in the, Europe, the U.S. market is if you have coax, we still want to get as much mileage out of the coax just because whether it's aerial or whether it's buried, um, yeah. it still costs money to yep. to, to pull to pull new fiber. Mm -hmm. And and so I think everywhere you go, if we can get more money out of the existing coax, that's one of the drivers. I mean, it was the driver for Doxus 3.0, it's a driver for Doxus 3.1. That's why we're looking at yep. full duplex Doxus. But to your point, full duplex Doxus, as we've covered in previous shows, means yep. that we're we have to have a node plus zero environment. And and that that means pulling fiber to right. the node. I mean, getting rid of all the actives after the node. Yep, and and uh, you know I do think that this technology um, can can help with that, right? Um, again, what I said in the beginning of the show: two billion, two point five billion dollars, Germany, for Germany only, the coming four years that that they save, that they would save using this technology. That's only Germany. That 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 is a huge impact on their capex budget. Money that can be spent elsewhere to really develop uh, services. Um, so th 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 there's no wonder that there is a high interest in, in uh, this kind of technology, right? Um, and um, it's um, indeed, as you say, the coax is part of their DNA, and they would want to to try to to utilize that as long as possible. But at the same time, you know, if I look at the LT's case, um, they're going like, you know, what if I have to dig fiber anyways? I'm gonna just keep on going and digging fiber, um, and uh, and do it that way. Although I'm not sure how how successful uh, Altis is is with that, um, but it is something that that is happening all the time. And as I said, we had that with two to do, with three to do, with three point one. Every time, as they should, operators are doing their due diligence. Should I go to fiber to the home, or should I continue with fiber with uh, with Doxis? 
Um, and every time, every time they're finding out that it is simply not cost beneficial to go fiber to the home and we rip the coax out uh, because it is very expensive to dig. It is very expensive to rip the coax out and put uh, put fiber in place. Yeah. And as as one, one more comment, as I always say, you might deploy PON, but guess what? PON is a shared medium, as is DOCSIS. So, you know, um, you're still hitting that same 10 gig backhaul. Um, uh, you know, it's uh, that it is it's it's always a quite polarized discussion, anyways, between fiber and DOCSIS. Yeah. Sharing is caring. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. so this uh, we're, we'll spend the last few minutes talking about Angacom show which is coming up. It's June 12th, 13th, and 14th, if I've got the dates. Yep, right. you got it. Um, so Angacom show is, uh, for, for those of you in the U.S. who've never gone to Angacom, it's very much like SCT Expo. It's a big focus on, on cable communications. Um, so fantastic show. Um, uh, I'll, I'll, let, uh, I'll let Daniel, I'll let you maybe give yeah. your take on Angacom from the, the European perspective. So, so in the U.S., you have uh, you have the SCTE. You've got you know the the, the little regional um, uh, shows, I think, as well. You've got the uh, summer conference, winter conference for the MSOs, right? The big ones, um, and uh, the, there's a light reading event as well that's there. Uh, but in Europe, we really only have one show uh, for cable, and that's the Anga, uh, the Anga Com. And right now, I think we we've got a record um, number of exhibitors, 460 so far. Which is uh, which is seriously um, a serious number, right? And probably the highest that they ever had. Um, so it's a very successful show. It's it's a real cable show. And, and guys in the US, if you do have the budget, come over visit. It's um, you know anything from from tabs up to virtualized platforms. Um, it's it, they've got everything there. It's a really uh, really uh, interesting show. Actually, the only one for cable that we have in Europe. Am I not offending anybody? No, because don't discount IBC. Don't discount IBC. IBC is not a cable show, right? IBC is a broadcasting show, um, and I've 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 spent many uh, years at at the IBC with with a UBR or with the CBR, not having having anybody talk to me. It gets really lonely as a cable guy at the IBC. Trust me. Um, and uh, but it's you, Amsterdam. You but it's Amsterdam, yeah. yeah. Exactly. <laughs> Claude Von Damme would know that. Uh, exactly. Yeah, muscles from Brussels. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I used to look like him, right? <laughs> um, so, so, Daniel, you're going to to Angacom. We'll see you there, right? Absolutely, I'll be there. Um, and uh, you know, anybody that that wants to see me live in person should visit the GX booth. Enter the Anga, go to the right, and we'll be there. Um, and I'm looking forward to talk to everybody there and explain more about this really cool technology. All right, John, what are you doing for Angacom? So yeah, I'll what are you doing, well. John? <laughs> <laughs> I'll be there kind of early because I'm helping out uh, set up some of the booth stuff. We'll be showing FTX demo. We'll have a remote buy interop with uh, a couple other RPD vendors, um, cloud, smart buy, um, mo 5G mobile. Um, I'm actually tasked with doing a little demo of the 5G mobile over at Doxus, uh, you know, for latency considerations. But I'll be there in the booth uh, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. Definitely uh, hope to have a good time there. I remember it didn't seem like Anga, Anga, however you pronounce it, it didn't seem like it was really that cable centric at the time, about five, six years ago. But now it seems to be more so. No, it's always been cable centric. It's um, it, it has always been. Um, you know, you do have another show in Europe that's the Cable Congress, but that's more a marketing thing these days. Um, so it's it's, uh, it's it's actually you know getting less and less interesting. Um, not to offend anybody that's listening in from Cable Congress, but from a technology perspective, that is that is reality. So I will be at Angacom this year, of course. Uh, I think it's a fantastic show. Right? And Daniel, as you said, I do encourage anyone in the U.S. who's not going, who hasn't attended before. Definitely attend Angacom. It's a fantastic show. I'll also be giving a presentation um, on Wednesday, June 13th at uh, <laughs> 3 p.m. in room two on DOCSIS 3.1 and big data. So really focusing on how especially PNM 
the massive amounts of data that we're pulling from PNM and Doxus 3.1 cable modems and CMTS is really driving the need for further big data. So please be sure to stop by and catch my presentation on Wednesday. Make sure you catch John. Make sure what you catch time is Daniel. That? Two, uh, 3 p.m. on Wednesday. Okay, good. Yes. Love, cool. love to see as many, many people there as we can. And it'll exactly. Be, it'll be a good presentation, I promise. We, we need to do a uh, how to survive Germany for a week without gaining 10 pounds because of the brats and the beer. Or <laughs> an even better one is how to survive Germany for a week without your wallet or any cash or credit cards, John. And I think you'd be a good one to feature that. I've seen you do it. I have lots of friends. <laughs> Make sure you yeah. along with lots of friends. Yes, John, take your wallet this year, please. So. <laughs> <laughs> All, All right. right. To my I remember that. Yeah. Jeez. Anything else you guys want to promote <laughs> while you're here? I've uh, got just a couple minutes left. I'm going to wrap up. No. Hey, really cool. Thanks for having me. Um, it's been really interesting. Absolutely. Yeah. It's a pleasure having you. Uh, John, I, anything for you? Yeah. I, I think it's, we, we've said that we try to be technology agnostic, and this is one way of doing that, right? I mean, we're not here just to promote. I work for Cisco, but I'm not here to just promote Cisco. Uh, but we've said this is all things doxless. So this is just another way to get the speeds to the customers. Uh, and we're still talking about doxless as well. You know, if we're using 10 yeah. gig over coax to an RPD, then the RPD is converting it back to a signal that the doxless modems can handle. Right. Yep. So I think it's good. More data, faster. So Exactly. John and Dan, thank you for your time today. Just another great ac episode. Our next episode is on June 22nd. Our topic is a review of the new technologies featured at Angacom. So we're, we're going we're gonna to cover everything that we see that we think is really cool, such as you know FDX and big data and Doxus 3.1, more things like that. We do our very best to bring this great technology that we can to our audiences every single month. You can watch us live or catch us on the air and watch our recorded episodes on YouTube, volpfirm.com slash events or download the audio only so you don't have to watch our ugly mugs with your favorite podcaster wow. if you <laughs> just talking about john and hey. i dan <laughs> okay there you go <laughs> <laughs> if you've enjoyed this web <laughs> if you enjoyed this webcast please do hit the subscribe button so you never miss an episode thanks so much for being here everyone and we'll catch you next month uh, have so a great long. weekend have a great weekend Ciao. Huh?